All right, let's open up our Bibles, please, to two places. In one hand, 1 Thessalonians 2, and in the other, Acts 27. 1 Thessalonians 2, and Acts 27. Thank you, my Lord. And in 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 13, the Bible says, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God which you heard of us, you received it not as it at, not as the word of men, excuse me, Lord, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Acts 27, verse 25. Notice the Apostle Paul wrote Thessalonians, and he testifies to this in his life when he says here in Acts 27, verse 25, after getting some revelation from God, he says, Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe, God, that it shall be even as it was told me. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning, Lord. We thank you for this chance for us to come together here at Bible Baptist Church's Resurrection Sunday to learn more about you and your word. And Father, I just ask that you fill us with the Holy Ghost. You'll be able to illuminate us a bit more about final authority, specifically the things that the Christian world at large does agree on, where we get to the heart of disagreements. And Lord, we give you thanks and praise for all things, especially for the salvation that was given by your Son, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. And this morning we're going to continue our studies here on final authority. Okay. And last week we discussed authority in general and thought about what that means and what it looks like and basically the world at large. And then made some connections towards religions as a whole, leading up to our discussion about what it's like in the Christian world. And what I mean by that are those that at least have the right gospel. So that'll be your evangelicals, your Protestants. Fundamentalists, at least the type that we follow, there's fundamentals in Islam and all that, they don't fit, okay? And Bible-believing Christians. We at least agree on the gospel and we at least profess a lot of the things we're going to look at this morning to start off, okay? And so you, you know, I actually learned this from a preacher here in uh, Indiana, uh, Pastor David Hoffman over in Lowell. Um, learned that when I was in school, this little series. So this is adopted primarily from him, okay, but I added a whole bunch of stuff including this section because I think it's worth it for the newer Christians to see what the Christian world at large actually agrees on before we start discussing this book. That's what it's going to culminate to and that's where all the disagreement actually is at. Okay? And so we see that Paul, he testified that Thessalonians seemed to recognize that the words he was writing on the page are not the word of men, but actually are in truth the word of God, and that's why it effectually works in their hearts and in their lives. And Paul didn't say that just because he thought it was cool. He actually believes that and told that to the individuals in his ship over there in Acts 27, such that, to try to give them confidence, because a storm was coming and the ship was about to get destroyed. And he told the Romans and everybody else there, look, we're all going to survive. God told me that, and I believe it exactly as he said. Okay. And so this is what Chris, the Christian world at least testifies. We claim to believe every word in this book. Okay. We claim to accept the things in there. But then why this book over any of the other texts that claim to be sacred or of God or have some kind of spiritual significance? Why the Bible? Okay. Go to Hebrews 11, verse 1. Hebrews 11, verse 1. And the truth is, brethren, it is a matter of faith. Okay. Hebrews 11 and verse 1, the Apostle Paul says, because he did write Hebrews. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Okay. And so biblical faith, at the very least, is not something that's blind. It's not something that you can't study and learn about. In fact, it has two key characteristics which are substance and evidence tied to them. And this is why we all know the verse, Now faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Because the word is that substance and evidence. That's why we use this book when we say, Hey, everything we believe is right here. Let me show you. Okay? Testifying to its final authority. Okay? 
And that's what Paul was thinking in Acts 27. He heard God speak to him and tell him, look, everybody's going to survive. It was words given by God, and that was enough substance and evidence for him. And that tends to be the case for all those that at least believe the gospel. They actually took that seriously, right? That's why they got saved. Okay? But it's important to see that your faith is not blind. It's not something called fideism. Many people are going to say that faith and reason don't come together. Or you can't have substance and evidence for it. That is a false dichotomy. It's not the case. Biblical faith especially is based on the evidence of what today is about. The resurrection, that's why we point everybody to it. Okay? It's a historical fact, in case people didn't realize that. Okay, We don't just... Oh, we're just going to go with this Jesus guy. No, not at all. He really did rise from the dead. Amen. Okay? And the same is true, really, for all of Scripture. Okay? Now go to 1 Thessalonians 5, please. 1 Thessalonians 5. And we may not cover all this this morning, but that's okay. 1 Thessalonians 5. And verse 20, here we see a command from Paul to the Christian church. Okay. And he tells us quite clearly here in 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 20, despise not prophesying. Okay. And there's two ways to read that. Despise not prophesying. That's what this is. This is the testimony of Jesus, the spirit of prophecy. This is prophecy, right? Okay. But then you should despise not prophesying things that are false. Okay. Depends how you look at that. But then he continues telling you how to do that in verse 21. He tells you to prove all things, okay? And then hold fast to that, which is good. And the Christian world does testify that the Bible is good, and all of it is. At least they say that, okay? It's not the truth for other sacred writ. It's not the truth for Vedas or the Rig Veda or the Tripitaka or the Quran. It's not the case, okay? Also for the Book of Mormon, okay? Nephi was not a prophet. Didn't even exist. Okay. Let's give you an idea. It's not the case here. This is real history. Okay. There's something here that's significant. It's got substance to it. And so we need to be as the Bereans, Acts 17, and search the scriptures in these things to see if they are so. And so that brings us to applying faith to the scriptures. Because if your faith is biblical and it's reasonable, it should be that God could testify to the truth of the scriptures from within them. Okay. You should be able to find, especially as a Christian, you already have the testimony of the Spirit of God. God should be able to show you what is the Bible. Why these 66 books is what I'm getting at. Okay. And so we have substance, which is that internal witness, and evidence, which is the external things most people are familiar with, to show these things and show, yeah, this is a book that we can trust and believe. There are things in here, okay, like angels that are real. Because the rest of this is. Okay? So it's not that much of a logical step. See what I'm saying? Okay. Many people, even in Christendom, okay, believe things that aren't in Scripture. Uh, I was dealing with a co-worker, and he believes that there's a portion of God that you just can't know at all. Okay? For those who know about Eastern Orthodoxy, okay, you got the essence-energy distinction. But this essence is like a hyper thing. You can't know anything about it. Makes me wonder how you can know you can't know anything about it, but that's part of the discussion we were having. Okay? And this is all analogy. None of this is real. So when I say you can know God, apparently that's not the case. It makes it very difficult to start conversation, doesn't it? <laughs> this is why it's important to discuss these things. What is your final authority? In his case, I'd argue it's some kind of father who came up with this philosophical stuff. Okay? Not this. That's why we have these discussions. And so substance, we'll skip Genesis 7 verse 23, but that's a defining verse. It tells you that living substances include people, animals, all these types of things. They're real. They have reality to them. Okay. So when the Bible says that faith is the substance of things hoped for, something, somebody's desiring something and through faith it comes to pass. Okay. That's why the Bible says in Hebrews 11, verse 3, that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that we understand that the things that we see are not made of things which do appear. Okay? And many brethren talk about atoms. Say, well, we can't see atoms. That's true. But it goes deeper than that. Okay? Information at its core. Words are things we can't really see. This, this is a representation of a word that we're reading here. 
Okay? I can't see God. He's the Word. See where I'm getting at? Okay? And He's the one by which all things consist. So that's how deep that rabbit hole can go. So much so that God, because He hoped for something in His creative act, in Psalm 33, verse 9, He spake and it stood fast, right? That's how things were created. He just, and God said. And God said, what was that based on faith? See that? So there's real substance and merit to it because God is real and that's how He operates. So what you're holding here is something that's so powerful that the world continues to exist because of it. Do you understand that? Okay. This is why God tells you to proclaim His Word. Okay. It's because you're wondering why. This has the power to discern the thoughts and intents of the heart, to make those separations. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. And it's why things were created and continue to sustain today. Okay. And so that we know that, okay, question becomes, can I prove the substance of the 66 books in this volume called the Holy Bible? Are there any words that testify to the reality of the books that I have? Okay, let's go to the easy one. Go to Luke 24. Luke 24, why is the Apocrypha not in this Bible right here, for example? There are parts of Christendom that say that we're missing at least six books, some of them seven. Okay, a lot of the, the older brother know what I'm talking about. But in Luke 24, and verse 44, we're going to see Jesus Christ tell us what is actually Scripture, at least for the Old Testament. Okay? He's the basis of this, because He is God manifest in the flesh. Luke 24, verse 44, okay? He says here, And He said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which are written in the law of Moses, one section, and in the prophets, another section, and in the Psalms, third section, concerning me. And he testifies to the authority of these three sections of the Old Testament. Okay. The shorthand for this, at least in English, is Tanakh. Okay. And I wrote it this way because if you were to see it in Hebrew, it would just be three consonants with some points for vowels. Okay. Why Tanakh? Okay. Kind of like laser, that's an acronym for light amplification. I'm not going to bore you. I'll continue that. We just call things lasers. We don't know what we're saying. Okay? Tanakh, Torah, first five books of Moses, the law. Nabim, okay? Which one is that? It's either the prophets or the Psalms. I forget, but that's just the fancy Hebrew word for this statement here that the Lord made. And Kethubim, okay? The writings, also known as the Psalms. So you got the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. So Tanakh is shorthand for this is the Old Testament. Okay? That's how Jesus proves to you that the 39 books in this list fit. The Apocrypha is not in these lists at all. Never has been, never will be. Okay. Now, everybody in Christendom seems to believe that. Okay. I haven't seen at least the Protestant with the right gospel running around with a book with 73 or 72 books. Okay. They tend to stick with 66. Okay. So thank God for that. He told us directly. That seems to be pretty simple. Okay. Fancy terms, the Apocrypha or the hidden text are not part of the Old Testament Canaan, which is a big word for a list. I don't, I don't know why we have to use all these words, but we don't have a choice now. We're, we're 2,000 years ahead of all these people who made up these words. Okay, so we have to talk their language to be able to write to people who are no things. Okay. And what about the New Testament, though? That seems a lot trickier. Can I show you that God testifies to every book in some way that's in your New Testament? Put it John 14. If there's substance to it, it has to be biblically based by the words that are in this book. Okay. And so John 14 and verse 12, we're going to see Jesus Christ in the upper room here before he went to Calvary to save us, talking to the eleven and telling them things they're going to be doing okay, for him. And one of those 11 is the one who wrote the Gospel of John. It's John. okay. So he's telling him something that he's going to be part of. And he says in John 14, verse 12, Verily, verily, I say unto you, that's, that's a pretty serious truth right there, okay, two times. He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also. Okay, and they did miracles, okay, for example. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And the question becomes, what are these greater works? Okay. 
What could be greater than miracle working power, the new birth, all these things? Is it an issue of quality or quantity? What is it? Okay. It's a good question. We don't know yet. What a verse 26. Okay. Verse 26. Same chapter. He continues and says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, notice it's not Muhammad, as some people say, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, talking to 11, and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. And that includes what we're reading, doesn't it? See that? So Jesus Christ is telling the 11, and John's here, look, you're going to end up writing the things that I say, and you're going to have to trust that my spirit's going to make sure you're writing what I actually said. I'm telling you it's going to happen. Okay? So now you're seeing that the 11 are getting justified in the testimony they're giving. Not just the resurrection, but even what's right here on the page in the gospel. Okay? Because he's the one who gave the power to them. What are the greater works? It might be this New Testament. Because, believe it or not, in the Lord's ministry, he physically did not write any words down. Okay? Now, I think he might in the future, but that's another discussion. Okay? I think there will be a time where God Almighty is going to write a portion of Scripture. It's possible. Okay? But not right now. He wanted to use men, his apostles, to do that. Okay? Now, a famous verse, the Spirit of Truth will guide you in all truth, John 16, verse 13. And as you know, if you read, he guides them in all truth. And guess what? The word is truth, John 17, verse 17. So now you know at least the 11 are testified of Jesus to be able to give us some kind of truth that's special and unique. Yeah. And I believe that's the scriptures here, this New Testament, because Peter wrote some, okay? And James wrote some, and John wrote some. Yeah. And then you got Jude, okay? And I think James is, is the Lord's, or not the Lord's brother, but John's brother, but that's another discussion. I'm just gonna say that. Okay, I'll let you figure that out on your own. Okay. Now, now what do we do about Paul, though? He wasn't here. Okay. What's going on with him? What is 2 Peter 3? 2 Peter 3. So Peter's justified, right? He was in that room. What does Peter say about what Paul wrote? Okay. I should have mentioned Matthew as well. He's another one that was there. Okay. But 2 Peter 3 and verse 15, Apostle Peter says, An account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, <clears throat> also, according to the wisdom given unto him, excuse me, <clears throat> hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, Speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures, unto their own destruction. So what you have here is Peter saying that Paul wrote scripture. So Jesus said, trust Peter, because the Holy Ghost is working through him. And Peter, with the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, tells you to trust Paul. See where I'm going here? Okay. Okay. And says that Paul wrote scripture. He wrote the word of God. Okay? Now granted, it doesn't say which, but that's enough for us to get to think that at least Peter believed when he was alive that Paul was already writing things down that were scripture. Okay? Notice the substance here. Notice how it backs itself up. It's self-attesting to the truth, as the truth should be. Because God is truth. He self-attests to his being. He is. Right? I am that I am. Okay? So now we got to think about, well, okay, the epistles of Paul or, or scripture. Do they testify to, for example, people like Mark and Luke? Because they're not apostles or anything like that, right? But I wonder if anybody cited stuff from Mark and Luke and called it scripture. Okay? Let me give you an example of that. 1 Timothy 5. 1 Timothy 5. First Timothy 5 and verse 18, the Apostle Paul says, For the scripture saith, okay, so whatever he's quoting here is scripture, okay, thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn. 
And many of you know that's Old Testament, okay? But he's not done yet. And, so the scripture says this too, the laborer is worthy of his reward. That one you can't really find in the Old Testament. Where is it? Go to Luke 10, okay? Luke 10. Guess who was talking here, okay? Pretty sure you know. Luke 10. And verse 7. Luke 10 and verse 7, the word incarnate speaking. Okay, and he says, And in the same house remain, eating and drinking such things as they give. For the laborer is worthy of his hire. There it is. Go not from house to house. But Luke wrote that. So how did Paul know that Jesus said that? Okay, maybe he got revelation. Yeah, it's true. Okay. But he's quoting scripture. Okay. Maybe he also knew that Luke wrote it down. And if he's quoting Luke here, okay, then I guess I could trust the rest of the gospel of Luke. See where I'm getting at here? That that opens up Acts as well, because he wrote Acts. Okay. What about Mark? Okay. Uh, I'll just say this, James 2 verse 8 quotes the, the second great commandment, love thy neighbor as thyself. We know in Mark that the Lord said that it is the second great commandment. There you go. Okay. <clears throat> and for those that are not aware, I put some verses there in Ephesians 2 and 1 Corinthians 12 that talk about the apostles and prophets being part of the chief cornerstone of the church. Okay. This is basic doctrine for most of us. Okay. If you don't know what I'm talking about, we can talk about it after the service. Okay. I'd love to teach you that. It's very important. But you got apostles who are also have can do prophet stuff, and then there were prophets, speaking prophets like Agabus, and writing ones like Luke and Mark. See that? So they gave us scripture. Okay. And so we see this testimony here, this substance to the reality that the New Testament is even testifying to itself. Okay. And so you can trust the New Testament too. Because it starts from Jesus promising that they're going to do greater works than these other things. Okay, One thing that Peter said is that he saw this great mount of transfiguration. He saw that. That was a real thing. He witnessed that. But he said the prophecy here was more sure than that. This more sure word that he ended up getting to write down. Okay, And so Christian trusts the internal witness. And most Christians who at least believe the gospel believe these things. Even if they didn't know all this cool stuff I just told you. Okay. They're like, no, no, it's the 66, okay? Not this other stuff I heard from some other church, okay? Now you can understand a little bit as to how you can justify that in here, okay? But let's move on to the evidence that most people know and use to justify at least the truth of Christianity. And that starts with the persons involved, the people, okay? And who better than our Savior, okay? The reason why my voice is messed up is because I finally went out last on Friday go to the corner, and it's been a while for me, so I worked out my voice pretty bad, okay? But I was telling people that our calendars are defined by Jesus Christ's life. That's one of the biggest things. Why are we in 2023 and not 5,700 whatnot, okay? If you go with the Jewish calendar or 59-something, if you go with uh, the year of the world calendar or what, what have you, why 2023, okay? And it's not because of common era. That's a recent thing, okay? It's because of Year of our Lord, A.D., Anno Domini, okay? His life was, had such an effect that little three years as carpenter in this pl random place called Nazareth affected history so much that we just can't help to reflect our calendars on this man, okay? Well, why? Who is this Jesus, okay? But what about the fact that you sing about him, okay? Let's, let's, th let's think of a, of a founder, I don't know, uh, Buddha. Okay, do people sing about him? Do Buddhists sing about him? <laughs> Brad's like, I don't know. No, they don't. Okay? But our founder, we do. Because he did all the work for us. Very different. Okay? Moses sung about God, not the other way around. Okay? Before you bring up Moses. And Muhammad, forget about him. Okay? I don't even know if singing was in his vocabulary, I wonder. Okay? And so we see this. Okay? Other religions don't come close to this reality. The actual founder of our beliefs is the one we focus on in worship and song. Okay? And there's so much written about him. Okay? 
Notice that. He affected our calendar system. He affected our music. He affected our culture. He affected our ethics. All this. This one man. One little lowly carpenter over in Nazareth. Is that... Why is that? Okay. Might be because he's got something serious to talk to us about. Okay. Which uh, Brother Noble is probably going to bring up in main service here. Okay. We'll point it today and really every day. But, you know, at least today the rest of the world kind of thinks about it. Okay. We're also interested in his life and in his teachings. Both. Not just his teachings. Okay. People like to hear what Muhammad said, but they don't like to look at what he did. Okay. What did he do? He was a pedophile. <laughs> Amongst other things. Okay. Can't say that about Jesus. He never sinned one time. Okay. People tried. He asked them, which of you convinces me of sin? Go ahead. Try me. They all walked away. They couldn't. See? So he walked the walk and talked the talk like we say in the streets, okay? His bark and his bite were the same, okay? That's why we're interested in his life and his teaching, so much so that we all have his life. If you're born again, you're partaking of the divine life right now, okay? And so we tell people about this, okay? We let people know, okay? And trust me, Mo Moses got a lot of good things about him, okay? But he didn't listen to God all the time, okay? Let's go to the one that isn't as close. Buddha, okay, he didn't even know if God existed, so he had all kinds of issues. Confucius at least believed in Shangdi, I think, depends on what you're reading from him, okay, what portion of the Analects. And he was pretty moral and all this, but he, he didn't really know anything more than that, okay. Socrates, do I need to say anything? No. Okay, he was a sodomite, if you need to hear at least one thing about this man, okay. Westcott and Hort, we're involved in witchcraft, among other things, and drunkenness. Okay. And I couldn't help but mention them, brother, because that leads into what we're going to be talking about later in this series. Okay. Because they're the be all end all of textual criticism. Okay. And then we got more than 500 people confirming his resurrection. Go to 1 Corinthians 15. We'll take the time to read these. 1 Corinthians 15. Notice all these evidences are technically historical in nature and also experiential right now for those who are partaking in the abundant life if you're born again. But 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 5, Paul tells us, look, talking about Jesus, and that he was seen of Cephas. But Peter saw him. Okay? He's a witness of his resurrection. That's why he was called to preach that resurrection. He saw it with his own two eyes. Okay? A bodily resurrection to the chagrin of JWs. Okay? Then of the twelve, after that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once. Okay. So they all hallucinate the same thing at the same time in the same way? As some people try to, to argue? That doesn't make too much sense, does it? Some people say that, though. Okay. It's kind of weird. The natural thing is to say, oh, well, all these people really witnessed the bodily resurrection of this man. It's a historical fact. Okay. Of whom the greater part remain unto this present. Paul's saying, look, at the time that he wrote this, you can go talk to these people, they'll tell you. But some are fallen asleep. They went to be with the Lord. They passed away. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also, as of one born out of due time. More than 500 people confirming his resurrection historically. Within that period of time of under 30 years, these people were alive at that moment. And they're telling you this. This is not a legend, okay? This is not a myth, nothing like that. This is legitimate history. How about this one lowly carpenter from Nazareth, okay? There's a, and we can keep going, right? We can talk about, why did John write against Gnostics and stuff like that? Because they couldn't deny Jesus was around. So they had to say, oh, he wasn't really physically here to try to deny some of the things of him being a man. Now it's the opposite, okay? Oh yeah, he was a man, but he wasn't God. Okay? De the devil isn't too clever. Okay? It's the same stuff. Repeated over and over again. You, you can trust that you have a final authority. Okay? Not only that, let's talk about people we do see around the Jews. You talk about a big testimony, it's them. Okay? Because they don't make no sense if you look at the scheme of history. 
Okay? Look, I'm Puerto Rican. We assimilated when we came here. Okay? I'm more American in that respect. It's not the case with the Jewish people over thousands of years. Okay? And this is why. Go to Deuteronomy 14. Deuteronomy 14. Let's see what God told them. Deuteronomy 14. And verse 12, or I'm sorry, verse 2, excuse me. Okay. Deuteronomy 14 and verse 2, God tells them, Look, for thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. And the Lord hath chosen thee to be a peculiar people unto himself above all the nations that are upon the earth. They have a special, unique identity. Okay. And guess what happened? Over 3,000 years, they continue to go all over the place, and yet, they haven't lost it. Because they're unique to God. They're peculiar. They're different. Okay? Now, like I say, compared to other nations, which is like your ethnicity, I guess, if you were to go by the scriptural definition. Okay? Nations, in this case, they come from a beginning. That's why I say that. Okay? Me? Yeah, yeah technically I'm Puerto Rican. I get it. Okay? But more American than anything else. Okay? Especially now as a Christian, I rejected Roman Catholicism. Okay. <laughs> That's part of my culture. Okay, I put that away. Okay. This is what usually happens with most groups when they go into other kingdoms, okay? Or mix around other people. They tend to coalesce and mix, never with the Jews. They always separate and they're different and they cause issues because they don't want to, for example, bow down to Caesar and all this stuff. Okay? Still true today? Hasn't changed. And that gets us to Zechariah 12, verse 3. We won't read it, but the world hates Israel. Okay? Rome had issues with them. Hitler has issues with them. The United Nations today has issues with them. Why? They're just a little tiny piece of sliver of land over there in the middle. Does that make any sense at all? You got the rest of the world there. Why are you all fighting for this piece of land that was completely desert in 1948, and all of a sudden it changed? I wonder why. Okay, why are you fighting for it? Okay? Because the enemy who influences the world, he's the god of this world, is against Israel. Right. That's why. I don't like that answer. Okay. Well, sociopolitically, there's really no legitimate reason, but everybody just seems to be against Israel. Except for us, and that's changing. Yeah. Unfortunately. Okay. That's why we pray during prayer meeting that America does right by Israel so we can keep the Genesis 12 blessing going. Okay. If this country doesn't do that, okay, what's coming is what we deserve. God. And that leads us into prophecy. Prophecy, because it's not just the people I just talked about, okay? It's the fact that these people have prophecy that backs up their lives and what they were doing, that testifies to the truth of their actions, okay? Jesus himself, he prophesied about his death, he prophesied about the manner or way he would die, and his resurrection in his ministry. Did you know that? Proving he is the prophet with a capital P, okay? Muhammad, he never got a prophecy right. Why is he called the prophet? Hmm. Okay. Matthew 16. Matthew 16. Let's look at this. Okay. Matthew 16 and verse 21. These are all things you can use with people, obviously, when you're evangelizing, because this is part of why you're a Christian. Okay. Your faith isn't blind, okay? It's supported by so much, it's unbelievable. I'm wondering why people aren't Christians, okay? Matthew 16 and verse 21, the Lord says, From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Notice he's telling them, this is what's going to happen to me. He knew about it before it happened, and he desired, he willfully went, Thinking about the joy that was set before him. Thinking about saving us. Okay, and giving us the opportunity to know him. So he endured the cross despising the shame, right? Okay, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't resist it. Okay? But notice he said that, okay? And he told them, look, the elders and the scribes are going to do something against me. Talking about the religious leaders of the Jews. Okay, so there's your Jews. Okay, are the Jews culpable? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, then we're good, right? Us Gentiles are good. Go to Luke 18. Luke 18, are we? Okay. 
Luke 18, verse 31. Here's the prophet with a capital P prophesying. Luke 18, verse 31. Look at the specificity of this. Okay, prophets don't do this. Nostradamus tried to be as vague as he possibly could be. Okay? Not God. Okay? As many of you know, in the Old Testament, he said, look, a king named Josiah is going to do this. Okay, you guys know that, right? Just... Cyrus is going to do this. Cyrus didn't even know about God until he ran into Daniel. But God's just giving his name, like, no. This, this is the prophet, this is the God of the Bible. Okay? Not like anything else. Luke 18, verse 31. Then he took unto him the twelve and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that were written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. This is facts, Jack, it shall be done. Why? 32. For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, and shall be mocked, and spitefully entreated, and spitted on, and they, that's the Gentiles, shall scourge him and put him to death, and the third day he shall rise. Again, look, about, look at that confidence. Okay? This isn't he will rise because the Bible and the Bible will is a desire, okay? No, he's saying this is going to happen. This is future written down before it happens, okay? And so what happened? The elders and scribes betrayed him to the Gentiles who did all those things. So we're both at fault, okay? And spiritually, you're a sinner? Okay, that's your fault, okay? Because he died to save the people from their sins, okay? He didn't have to die. He chose to do that. He knew about it and yet said, I'm going to go. Said his face is flint and went directly there thinking about the joy of knowing you personally when you come to him. So yeah, okay. Very specific. Jews and Gentiles, all mankind has guilt. What are you going to do with Jesus? Typical way to present the gospel and get right into it, okay. But that's evidence, okay. Another one is the temple being destroyed. We won't read it, but in Matthew 24, he says that it happened in 70 AD. Okay, I'll let you study that on your own. Okay. What about the kingdoms of the world? Who's read the book of Daniel? Okay. Preachers did a whole study on the book of Daniel. Talking about all that. Daniel talked about all these kingdoms coming. Okay. Talked about Greece. Talked about per media, Persia, all that. Before it happened. Okay. That's how God is with prophecy. Very direct. Okay. Greece and Rome, and now we're in the mystery portion of Rome. I'll just guide you to preach your stuff. You already covered it these last couple Sundays. Went all through that. Okay. What about Israel proper? Okay, the fact is the Bible says that if they didn't respond to their prophet with a capital P, they would be scattered. Okay. Famous word today is a diaspora. Okay, for that. And what happened? Israel got scattered for almost 2,000 years, and even now they're still scattered. They should go back, but only so many have gone back. There's still way more Jews in America, for example, than over in Israel. Shouldn't be like that, okay? Now, this was prophesied. Go to Romans 10, okay? Romans 10. Paul trying to work with his people here. In Romans 10, verse 19, Paul says, But I say, did not Israel know? First Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people. That's us. Okay. And by a foolish nation, I will anger. And he's trying to provoke Israel to jealousy by witnessing and working with the Gentiles who get saved. Okay. Hoping they'll come. And if they don't, we won't read this, but in Deuteronomy 32, God says, I'm going to scatter you throughout all the nations, and you're going to deal with all this confusion because you rejected me. And Jesus Christ is Jehovah God, if you didn't know. Okay, the same God. Okay. Verse 20, same chapter, talking about the Gentiles. Okay. Paul says, look, but Hosea is very bored and saith, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. Okay? And guess what? God was made manifest to you. And you didn't ask about him because you didn't even know who he was. Okay? I heard I believe in a higher power. Okay? That was me at one point, and then I thought I was the higher power. Thank God he manifested himself to me and gave me the proverbial smack in the face to wake up. Okay? Show me these things specifically about that little carpenter from Nazareth to wake me up. Okay? 
And those evidence have substance that affect the heart. Okay? That's why we preach these things. Okay? And Gentiles, it was prophesied that God would work through you to reach his people again. And we're living that right now. Okay? And then you got the power of the scriptures because the Bible says in Ecclesiastes 8, where the word of a king is, oh, what, what's this called? King James Bible. Oh, sorry. Word of a king is there is power. It doesn't say where the, where the word of a new is, like New International Version. It doesn't say that. Okay? Where the word of a king is, there is power. And for that reason, that power is manifested in the preservation of the scriptures in spite of its enemies. Because the words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou, that's God, thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation, written back in 1000 BC or whatever. Okay? From this generation forever. That includes now, 2023. Okay? So in spite of all the attacks from the enemy working through this world, trying to get people to destroy the word of God, we still have all of it. It's preserved. The power of the words of a king. I quoted Psalm 12, by the way. Once, once that was there, okay, the devil couldn't do anything about it. Okay? God's going to make it happen. Okay? And then you got the reality. For most of Christendom, they believe this book is without error. They call that inerrancy with their fancy word. Okay? That it's at least truth. Now, what kind of truth, how strong the truth is, that's another discussion. We'll get there. Okay? They don't agree with us on that. I'll just say that right now. Okay? We think truth is truth. They got a little bit of skewing going on there. But they claim it's without error in spite of its enemies. Go to Psalm 19. Psalm 19. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Psalm 19, verse 9. David says here, because he knew about this. Okay. And he says, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. Notice the, the word of God has another term called the fear of the Lord. Okay, so if you ever wondered, it's one way to define it. Okay, this right here. Why do you care about what this book says? Because you fear God. Right. People who don't care about this book don't fear God. They do whatever they want. Okay. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. It's going to endure. Okay. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Okay. Now, if you believe it's without error, then it's truth, okay? And that means it has a moral obligation on you to do right by it. That's why it's righteous altogether, okay? And then we see the power of the scriptures in your life. Are you born again? Go to James 1. James 1. And notice who I believe to be the Apostle James. Okay, you may believe it's the Lord's brother. Okay, he's an apostle too. Okay, not an apostle of the Lamb. But in James 1, verse 21, James says here, it says, Wherefore, okay, after telling people to be swift to hear and slow to speak and slow to wrath, because the wrath of man doesn't work the righteousness of God. So he says, Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity uh, of naughtiness. And receive with meekness, that means accept the judgment that's told you. you. know, Don't try to defend yourself or justify yourself. Just be like, yes, I'm a sinner, for example. Receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. And that brings us full circle. Because faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And it's the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And it's that same word that works in your heart, in order to get you saved, okay? I didn't quote what Peter said for a reason. We'll get there as we continue the series, okay? Because some people in Christianity don't believe it the way we do, okay? We think it's incorruptible. kind of don't, okay? But they do believe that the power of God is witness in the lives of them as they experience God after receiving him for salvation and seeing him change their lives and make them not only better people, but people that know him personally. Okay? And so I'm gonna let the preacher talk about this during the main service, but my question is, have you received the word of God? Okay? Have you recognized Christ Jesus and saw his resurrection power and how that affect your heart and your life? How do I do that? Okay? 
Well, kind of got to be like Peter. You got to go and look at the Lord, okay? You do it by faith. And say, look, I get it, Lord. Depart from me, for I am a sinful man. I, I'm not just a sin, somebody who sins, and but I'm definitely good. No, no, no. I'm a sinful man. I chose these things, okay? Now, you do that honestly, looking God to God with the eye of faith, okay? God the Father, when you repent in that way, he's going to tell you, trust in Christ and his work. And all of a sudden, the Lord's going to come to you and extend his right hand of fellowship and lift you up and give you the new birth and make you stand and make your spirit alive so it's not dead in trespasses and sins anymore. And all of a sudden, just like the Lord told Peter, look, follow me. I'm going to make you a fisher of men. That's what happened. Okay. So my question is, okay, have you received the final authority in your heart? It's the only way you're going to see the manifesting power of his person as he prophetically saves you in your life. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you, Lord, for showing us all these great things about the final authority. And I just ask, Lord, that you help us to see the similarities we share with most of the Christian world. And help us to recognize that it's a blessing to know that we can go with another brother in Christ no matter where they are, no matter what other things they, they believe, if they got that gospel right. 